Today's show is brought to you by HelloFresh. Visit HelloFresh.com and use promo code GEMS30 to save $30 off your first week of deliveries. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 211. I am just back home from another trip to New York City, where I got together again with Beth Forrester over at Animoto. And you'll remember Beth from our recent webinar that we did there at Animoto. And this time around, we did a full day of filming over at Ellis Island. I sat down with Jackie Schock. She's the director of the American Family Immigration History Center there at Ellis Island. And I got to tell you, she provided some really great insight into interpreting those passenger list records of Ellis Island that you can look at on their website, but you can also dig into right there at Ellis Island at the American Family Immigration History Center. And I also chatted with Barry Moreno of the Bob Hope Memorial Library at Ellis Island. And uh, he's the author of several books on Ellis Island and other related topics. Barry gave us a behind the scenes look at the library there, which actually is open to the public, but I don't think it's on a lot of people's radar. There was almost nobody in there. You kind of go through a, a little quiet side door. But there's some amazing resources there. And of course, it was just great to be able to sit down in one of their recording booths where they conduct their own oral histories and be able to chat with Barry about the history of Ellis Island and and some very unique features there. So I'm really looking forward to bringing those interviews to you soon on the podcast. And of course, you're going to be seeing some videos over at the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. So if you haven't uh, subscribed to that yet, it's absolutely free. You just go to youtube.com slash genealogy gems, click subscribe, you'll get a little notification when those videos come out. My daughter Hannah accompanied me on this trip, and she served as the production assistant on the project. And it was such a touching experience to share not only the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island with her, but also to be able to share how these places really intersect with our own family history. I think it really makes it real. And I think it was more meaningful for her to be there in person and and kind of see what our ancestors went through there. We also encountered a bit of genealogical serendipity, if you will, on this trip. We were there at Ellis Island uh, in Lower Manhattan on October 13th, 2017. It was Halloween. And by mid-afternoon, we were going to be heading back from the island over to Battery Park in Lower Manhattan. But we decided the last minute to stop and we wanted to shoot a few more additional kind of short segments that we could use later in the production. So we ended up actually getting back on the ferry about an hour later than we planned about 4.30 or so. And we immediately, all of us started getting texts from loved ones who were checking to see if we were okay. So of course, we were like, "Uh, why? (laughs) What's going on? And as it turned out, Just an hour earlier, there was a terrorist attack uh, just down the street from Battery Park on the bike trail there that, according to news sources, left eight dead and 12 badly injured. And as we got off the ferry, you could see the flashing lights going by. We could hear the sirens. The traffic was at an absolute standstill. And our plan had been to tour around a bit in lower Manhattan and maybe grab some dinner before we grabbed an Uber car to head back to Brooklyn. Instead, Beth, who of course is a local there, she guided us to the nearest subway station and we jumped on the subway, got back to Brooklyn and picked up our car on that side, uh, which was the right thing to do because they started closing tunnels. In fact, I think temporarily they may have closed the Brooklyn tunnel that we had used to, to drive over that morning. So we are very grateful and thankful to have been able to quickly and safely leave that area. And our hearts and prayers go out to the families of the victims of 
what was the first terrorist attack in New York City since 9-11. So we're thankful to be home. And I am thankful to be able to talk genealogy with you here on this episode. And in today's episode, you're going to be hearing from the archive lady, Melissa Barker. She's going to tell us about the National Archives Citizen Archivist Program. And I'll tell you how volunteers coordinated by the British Library are geotagging thousands of old maps that are already online, which can certainly help with your research. Two listeners have written in about rescuing old artifacts and returning them to those who might be interested, like a giant genealogy lost and found. Also, Michael Strauss of Military Minutes is going to profile a crucial but partially destroyed 20th century record for U.S. servicemen and women, the official military personnel files. And you will hear what he found in his own grandfather's file. And because this is November and the month of Thanksgiving, you're only going to have one episode this month of the Genealogy Gems podcast here on the free show, um, so that all of us here at Genealogy Gems can get together with our families. I'm really excited. My uncle is coming into town from the West Coast, and Hannah and her husband will be coming up from the Texas coast, and we are all going to be together here at the Cook Ranch in Texas. Now, as I mentioned, Melissa Barker, the archive lady, has some news about the National Archives Citizen Archivist. Hello, this is the archive lady. There is news from the U.S. National Archives. They want you to become a citizen archivist. Have you heard? The U.S. National Archives is looking for citizen archivists. What is a citizen archivist, you may ask? A citizen archivist is a virtual volunteer that helps the U.S. National Archives increase the online access to their historical records. This is done by crowdsourcing metadata about their records through tagging, transcribing, and adding comments to the U.S. National Archives catalog. As a citizen archivist, you will be volunteering your time to make historical and genealogical records more accessible to the general researching public to help them with their research. This can include genealogists, historians, writers, and other researchers that will benefit from your volunteer work. And who knows, maybe you will find records that belong to your ancestors. First, you will need to go to the Citizen Archivist Dashboard, which is located on the U.S. National Archives website. Once there, you will need to register to be a Citizen Archivist. The registration is free, but you do need this account to be able to contribute to the project. Once you are registered and logged in, you can then navigate to the catalog and choose records from the curated missions. The missions are groups of records that need transcribing or tagged to help the records be more accessible by researchers working online. Some of the missions that are needing transcribing are Fugitive Slave Case Files, Native American Reservations, and the Truman Churchill Telegrams, just to name a few. New missions are added to the site regularly, so be sure to check back often to see what's new that you could work on in your spare time. Anyone who has a computer and the willingness to volunteer time to this project can contribute. You do not need to commit to any amount of time. You can work at your own pace as you have that extra time. There is even a support community available through the History Hub that can answer your questions as you work through the records. So, if you have some time in your hands and want to help make historical and genealogical records more accessible online, Why not become a Citizen Archivist today? Now, for those of you who are looking for other interesting ways to get involved in citizen archiving projects, the British Library is still recruiting volunteers to help georeference thousands of old maps that are already online. Georeferencing, or what they call geotagging, means that you're assigning geographic reference points, latitude and longitude, to points on a map image. So whatever the current 
reference points are on today's map, you match that up on the historic map so that the two can kind of come together. And doing this with old maps allows them to be linked, of course, to their modern day locations, which allows us to compare the past and the present, which of course is something that I teach you to do yourself in my Google Earth video class. And of course, in my book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox, both of which you can learn more about in the show notes. According to the British Library Georeferencer Project webpage, over 8,000 maps have already been placed by participants and subsequently checked for accuracy, and then they get approved by their panel of expert reviewers. The latest phase of the project includes 50,000 maps from the British Library collection. They're mostly made up of 19th century maps that come out of books um, published in Europe. The maps themselves have already been digitized by Microsoft, and they are posted to the Flickr Commons as public domain images, which of course means they're free to use. They're not under copyright. So let me share with you here the invitation to volunteers from the British Library. It says, help us identify accurate locations for these historic maps. Bear in mind that some places have changed significantly or disappeared completely. Your name will be credited and your efforts will significantly improve public access to these collections. Contributors can see the results of their work as well as the progress of the pilot and other participants. And the top contributor will be publicly announced. So a little chance to give back and uh, be helpful to all researchers and genealogists. And let's see here, uh, in Genealogy Gems News, besides the trip to New York, uh, I think our last seminar of 2017 was in Roswell, New Mexico. I've never been there before. It's kind of the, uh, I guess the, what, UFO capital of the world, (laughs) or at least of the US. We certainly saw lots of alien statues and signs and things in Roswell. We also met up with a lot of really enthusiastic, terrific genealogists. The folks in Roswell, the Wilson Cobb Genealogical Society, they know how to put on a party. So it wasn't just a seminar, it was a party. It was a, a beautiful kind of fall themed party with amazing food. I would walk in the door and everybody would say, you've got to get to the food table. (laughs) And they just had tons of food, um, lots of things to look at, lots of enthusiastic uh, genealogists who were just really interacting and sharing with each other all throughout the day. In fact, there were people from all the way from Oklahoma, Uh, There was a large contingent from Texas, all my new best friends from Texas who came in all the way. That's really nice. And there was even a couple there from California who I think they were checking the website at Roswell, spotted the genealogy seminar, and they joined us. It was an awesome party. So thank you so much to all the folks there in Roswell, New Mexico. And the other new thing happening here at Genealogy Gems is we do have a brand new premium video for you, for all of you premium members, called Share Your Life Stories More Meaningfully. Now, every life is fascinating when it's well shared, right? That's the key, how you share your stories. You're going to learn in this video class, which is part of your premium membership, from Sunny Morton. She's the author of Story of My Life, a workbook for preserving your legacy. And you're going to learn what stories that you have that are really worth telling, and several inspiring reasons to write them if you need a little extra inspiration. In the class, she will review different kinds of memories, why some memories are more vivid than others, and how to really flesh them out. It's really the how to, isn't it, that you need. She's going to help you do that so that you can move forward in telling your stories. You're going to learn tips for researching the gaps in your memories, how to turn a memory into a really good story, and what to leave out, and several ways to share your stories. And I find that sometimes it's what you leave out that really makes the difference. Because a story is different than than the whole comprehensive tale. And a story well told is one that will be shared and appreciated, and they will ask you for more. 
So this is really, I think, a class that everybody can benefit from. So check that out. Sign in on the website at genealogygems.com into your premium membership. If you're not a member yet, feel free to join us over at the website. Sign up and you'll have access to all of the, the premium video classes that we have. And of course, the handouts. And Sunny definitely has a handout for you for this class. And if you're listening through our Genealogy Gems app, and I certainly hope you are because uh, listening through the app is way easier than, than going through iTunes or anything else. Your bonus content that you get in the app for this episode is a preview of the new premium video class, Share Your Own Life Stories More Meaningfully. So you will be able to watch that quick little preview, see what is coming up in that class. The app is available in Google Play for Android, and it's also available for iPhone and iPad users and window mobile users. And stay tuned because in the next Genealogy Gems podcast episode, Sunny is going to join me to talk about the challenge of turning your memories into stories, which is one of the things that she does share in that premium video class. All right, well, it's now time to hear what you've got to share. And we're going to do that over at the mailbox. From my old hometown One with some jokes From my old pal Jim Brown Bring me a letter From that girl of mine Saying that he's longing for me All the time Bring me a letter From my proud old dad that we are winning, and I bet he's glad, but more than any other, a line from my old mother. Bring me a letter from my hometown. I have an email here from Roland in Mississippi. He says, love the podcast, information, hints, suggestions, and endorsements. I've been conducting family research for about a year. It became clear early on that your website and podcast were at the top of the heap for a novice such as myself. And so I follow both religiously. Thank you, Roland. We appreciate that. Additionally, your broadcast from Roots Tech interviews with various experts and fellow webcasters and so forth have also introduced me to other sources that advance my knowledge and research results. I have your book on utilizing Google and I use Backblaze happily based on your recommendation. And of course, Backblaze is the the cloud backup service that we use here at Genealogy Gems. He says your sincerity in educating genealogists and family researchers is plainly evident. Thank you. Well, thank you, Roland. He says, I recently ran across a funeral booklet in a relative's ancestry research materials that I could not connect to that relative in any fashion. Hmm. It was printed professionally in 1944 by the deceased's husband and contained a photo, complete biography, obituary, and portions of the minister's eulogy. I looked into Ancestry.com to see if anyone was researching the lady and made a connection with a direct descendant. By the time you receive this, I will have mailed it to that individual for their use. I understand he had never seen a photo of this particular relative. I've been the recipient of others' selfless research and efforts, so I try to digitize, share, and move information along to others. When I reach the place where I don't personally need to store some items, I intend to donate them to the appropriate place or individual for further maintenance. I think it's important that we don't accidentally hoard data, photos, or any information. I'm grateful that institutions, libraries, and all sorts of data collection sites around the globe are digitizing and making their information available to researchers like myself. It's priceless. Again, thank you, Roland. Well, I love this perspective on sharing. I think it's a really great reminder. You know, some folks feel irritated when they see a copy of an old photo that they know originates from their tree or somebody else's tree. 
I know I see photos that I know distinctly came from my own collection and my own tree on all kinds of trees that are related to my family. But Roland reminds us how we've all benefited by the selflessness of others. And it's so true. When we do share, it, it reaches a lot of different families. And it, it can feel kind of tough because we work so hard sometimes to gather some of that information. But I tend to think that history actually doesn't belong to any one of us, does it? We're kind of caretakers along this journey. And I think that, Roland, your selfless attitude towards this is really commendable. And how awesome that you stop and take the time to get materials into other people's hands when you know that in some ways it's more relevant to their family history than to your own. It's a good reminder. I'll be back with more items from the mailbox right after this. If you don't have cloud backup for your computer yet, everything on it is vulnerable to loss. Your pictures, your master genealogy database, files for work, the everyday business of your household, losing all that at once is as devastating as it sounds. That's why I did my homework and I found a cloud-based backup service provider. I chose Backblaze. It runs in the background 24-7, automatically saving copies of everything, including my precious video files. Did you know that some of the other leading services actually skip your video files when they do the backup? Hello, not good. And Backblaze is so easy to use. I love their free app that allows me to access all my files if I need to from my smartphone or my tablet. Most importantly, the service is totally affordable for real people. It's just $5 a month. So don't wait to ensure that all your files are safe. Do it now. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head over to backblaze.com slash Lisa and get that $5 a month deal. Check it out for yourself. You could even do a free trial. That's backblaze.com slash Lisa. As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic Web Hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. Back here in the mailbox, I heard from Linda. She says, just discover genealogy gems, and I've been overdosing on the podcast, so I don't remember which episode mentioned old photos. But I wanted to tell you about something that I'm involved in. I had a big box of unidentified photos from my grandmother. Most appeared to be from the early 1900s. I've been decluttering and couldn't keep them any longer, but didn't know what to do with them. Hmm, has that happened to you? I'm guessing that uh, many of you (laughs) can sympathize with her. She says, I wrote an email to the local history buff in the little town in, in Iowa where my grandparents had lived, suggesting that I might just throw them out. She almost had a heart attack. (laughs) She wrote back and said that she would take them. Actually, what she really said was don't ever, ever throw out old photographs. So I sent her the box. When she got it, she wrote me that she felt like a kid at Christmas. For the last three weeks, she and some of the other volunteers at the Historical Society have been identifying people in the pictures and attaching them to find a grave memorials and posting them on their Iowa Gen website. They also have plans to display them at the annual 4th of July festivities to see if attendees can identify more. And lastly, I've queried some Ancestry members who have some of the people in their trees to ask if 
they can identify those that we think may be their relatives. And I'm hoping I'll get a response and they'll be eager to help. There are only about 20,000 people in Page and Taylor counties, but hopefully we are preserving the history of those two Iowa counties and the people who call them home. Ah, another wonderful giving project, don't you think? What can you do with a collection of unidentified photos? You can return them to a loving home. And in this case, it was a local historical society. And she wisely kept that collection together because often there's power in what some of the photos may tell you about other photos. When you separate them, you lose that context. So I think having them all go together made a lot of sense. And I love what the society has been doing with the photos. I mean, again, like what Roland was talking about, get them digitized and out there where those who want them can find them. Places like Find a Grave Memorials, they put them on their US Gen website, and even displaying them for locals to look at personally and try to identify. And if US Gen Web is new to you, We've talked about it here on the show before. It's a free volunteer site with great information on every state and every county. Go to usgenweb.org. And historical and genealogical societies can also share mysterious photos on their websites or their local library website if they don't have one of their own. Or you can set up a free blog or put them on your Facebook page or even print in your regular newsletter. These are great conversation pieces, especially when you can later report that you've actually solved the mystery and you've helped somebody in the process. I've reported on efforts like these in the past. Uh, One that comes to mind is Sandra Stocks, who saw old photos published in her local newspaper, and she decided to help identify them. And she did. See the show notes to read more about her project. It's really cool. And some tips that she shared with us here at the podcast to help with your own photo mysteries. Well, thanks to all of you who wrote in. And of course, you can email me here at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. You can even leave a voicemail on the voicemail line. And we may play it here. 925-272-4021. From my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I bet he's glad For more than any other A line from my old mother Bring me a letter From my home Have you tried the HelloFresh meal kit delivery service yet? HelloFresh delivers delicious, easy to cook dinners to your doorstep in a recyclable, insulated box, and it comes out to less than $10 a meal. It has actually made cooking fun for me, and now I look forward to making dinner, which is a big change. No more decision making or last minute shopping. Each week, HelloFresh creates new delicious recipes with step by step instructions designed to take around 30 minutes. All of the ingredients come pre-measured in really handy labeled meal kits, and they're measured to the exact quantities needed, so there's never any food waste. I'm not having to go in later and throw stuff out of my refrigerator. And you never get stuck in the middle of preparing a meal and then realizing that you don't have the ingredients that you need. You get three plans to choose from. They have classic, veggie, and family. Bill and I selected classic, and we got the meals that are perfectly portioned for two people. I love being able to whip up healthy and satisfying meals that Bill loves too, that I don't have to pre-plan. That has always been my personal stumbling block in cooking dinner. HelloFresh is so convenient and it's easy, which means we enjoy yummy dinners and I have more time to do the genealogy research and podcasting that I love. And here's their very special offer. Use the promo code GEMS30 for $30 off your first week of HelloFresh. Just visit HelloFresh.com and use the promo code GEMS30. That's HelloFresh.com. You're going to love it. Battalion, attention. Right, dress, front, right shoulder, arms, forward, march. <laughs> 
Hello, listeners. We've mustered you for another episode of Military Minutes with Michael Strauss. Last month, we talked about the compiled military service records. To recap, if your ancestor served in the military during the 19th century or earlier, then the records are in the custody of the National Archives in Washington, D.C. The exact dates for each military branch will vary in years accordingly. For an example, Army enlisted personnel before 1912 and Marine Corps personnel before 1895 are in the custody of the archives. If your ancestor served during the 20th century or 21st century, the records are located at the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis, Missouri. There are exceptions to veterans discharged from 1995 to the present. And these vary in years by branch, as they are held in the custody of other government offices. The records in St. Louis are referred to as the Official Military Personnel Files, or simply the OMPF Files. The files are also called the 201 Files, and they're named after the brown file folder that holds the personnel files. The records in St. Louis are not without their setbacks. On July 12, 1973, a disastrous fire ravaged the building where the OMPF files were housed. Between 16 and 18 million of these files were destroyed or damaged. Army personnel discharged between 1912 and 1960 sustained an 80% loss, four in every five files. Air Force personnel discharged between 1947 and 1964 sustained a 75% loss, three in every four files. But this only started alphabetically after the name of James E. Hubbard. The Navy, the Marines, and the Coast Guard were largely unaffected by the fire. Genealogists should be aware that the OMPF files are considered archival, open without restrictions, 62 years after the date of discharge. This is a rolling date. Discharge dates of 1955 and earlier are open to the public. In 2018, that date will change to 1956 and so on. After this date, records are considered non-archival. They're subject to restrictions. Only the veteran or his next of kin can have full access to these files. Now, patrons can access the records in St. Louis in one of three ways. They can make the pilgrimage to St. Louis. It's recommended, however, that you make an appointment, as the research space there is limited. You can employ an independent researcher. There's an online list of researchers available for hire. Or lastly, you can request the record by mail using what is called Standard Form 180. And this is online and available to researchers to download. Now, I didn't fully grasp how many records were lost in the fire until I ordered a record of one of my family members. My grandfather, Richard Keller, when he was a small child, received postcards from his great uncle, Zerby Howard. Now, I remember him. He died when I was 10 years old. Zerby served during World War I and was a resident of Lebanon, Pennsylvania. I have in my possession two postcards that were sent to my grandfather. They recorded his name, his rank, and his military unit. I ordered his file, and it took several months. And when it arrived, I expected it to be full of information. His file was completely destroyed, and only some reconstructed records were located, which was three pages, which recorded him on a final payment roll with other men from his unit. I've included in the show notes the copies of the pages I received from St. Louis. Now, St. Louis has other records available to researchers. The Army filed morning reports organized by unit. I also searched in Pennsylvania and found records at the local level that were not in the hands of the federal government. These records will be discussed in a future episode. Listeners, you're dismissed until next month when we will again muster in and go back to the days of the Revolutionary War and the subsequent years that followed after the birth of our Republic, where we will discuss what it meant to be a volunteer soldier, a regular soldier, or a militiaman. Until next time. probably found wonderful old photos and documents in your research, but that's not exactly exciting stuff to your kids and your grandkids. The truth is, the non-genealogists in our families aren't captivated by the same things we are, but you can change all that with Animoto.com. Start creating fabulous videos about your family history that they won't be able to resist. And you don't have to have any special skills. With Animoto, you drag and drop your files in, like photos and even video clips. 
pick from their professional styles and huge music catalog, and voila, you've got an awesome video. I've made dozens of these, and my family loves them. Hey, my grandson didn't mention the Legos that I gave him for his birthday, but he did thank me for the video that I made. You've got to try this out for yourself. Visit Animoto.com. Our sponsor for this episode is MyHeritage, which has over 70 million members worldwide. If you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. Post your tree on My Heritage and start to see the magic as they automatically match it up with other trees, not just with genealogists in the country where you live, but around the world. Trees aren't primary sources, but they are excellent leads. I uploaded a portion of my family tree that contains my German heritage, and that's where I was really hoping to make a breakthrough, and very quickly it happened. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany. That was my first international cousin contact. But there's more at MyHeritage. Their unique and powerful search system, it's called Record Matches. It constantly calls over 5 billion historical records for your family. It's the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. It is also the first to translate names between languages. Find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. On my recent trip to Ellis Island, I made my way to a corner alcove on the third floor to the Bob Hope Memorial Library. In its out-of-the-way location, it's often overlooked by tourists, and yet it's brimming with little-known historical treasure, including its librarian and resident historian, Barry Moreno. He's the author of several books on Ellis Island, and on Halloween Day of 2017, we sat down to chat in an even more tucked-away corner, the recording booth at Ellis Island designed to collect oral histories. Accompanied by my daughter Hannah and Beth Forrester of Animoto, who captured our meeting in photos, I asked Barry about getting young people interested in history, the history of Ellis Island itself, and the unique family of workers who made it all run. Here's my conversation with Barry Moreno. Particularly when young people come to Ellis Island, do you find them connecting? I mean, I was showing my daughter a document of the fact that uh, her great-great-grandmother was 31 Mm -hmm. when she came, and she's got a three-year-old in tow. Mm -hmm. She's a young lady still. She still has more children to have (laughs) and, and a home to establish. So these are pretty much adventurers, as far as I can see. Well, I think people learn about these stories. They learn about their ancestors and they suddenly get actual documents to show the activity of these people whom, before they just thought of them as being vague shadows of their descent with not much meaning, but suddenly they actually get records to show someone is 31 years old, it's a young married woman. Mm -hmm. Suddenly they begin to take a real form, not just a shadowy image, but suddenly they become real people a hundred years ago. You know, for instance, suddenly they realize these people they thought of in a vague way were really flesh and blood. And that's what fascinates people more and more. Once they began to see things, they actually get records, become close, close to their, to all these people. And it just makes them think differently. Yeah, it makes it real. And I I don't think that's often present with a lot of, a lot of people, of course, have no interest in because they don't see the they they're not aware of that or they're just not interested in the past. Obviously, I'm interested in history. Yes. <laughs> so, when you're a historian like I am, it doesn't take much to get you interested in 
and helping. Because if I do a lot of research for all sorts of things in history, so naturally to do it through about with genealogy and using records, that's quite exciting to me. Mm -hmm. And quite a natural thing for me to do. And, you know, uh, ever since I was a child, I was interested in descent, particularly of notabilities, like, you know, like if you study royal descents Mm -hmm. in different families uh, throughout history... You know, so I was always interested in things like that. But it, but not everyone is. But as as people become more aware of uh, the real the reality of these people, they become more and more interested. I think, and certainly millions of people are involved in this. In fact, the, with the opening of this museum at Ellis Island in 1990, that increased people's interest in genealogy through immigration. Tremendously. It, it Tremendously. opened up doors. And I think that's another thing that's changed the the landscape is that there's just accessibility that there wasn't. You know, it, right. it wasn't even lack of interest. It was like you couldn't even go there. So, But now you guys can. And, and I hear you're bringing back records that you really struggled through the, the Hurricane Sandy. And yeah. that hit you and touched Ellis Island like it touched everybody that's else. That's right. Um, you mentioned that you had an interest in history. Did that include your own family from the earliest of times, or did a that little grow bit. over time? Some, it was some family interest, but it, it was more. In, yeah, I was interested in political and cultural history in general. So, mm-hmm. I mean, certainly, of course, you're interested in your family. You want to know about those things, but uh, because my interest was rather broad, it didn't. It wasn't isolated to my own background. It was. It was more than that. Mm-hmm. So, because it's it's really exciting to to research people's history and their lives. But I mean, obviously, celebrities' lives are very a lot of fun, and um, to find out what made them, you know, make certain decisions in life that led them to becoming, you know, especially important in culture and in a culture or society is fascinating. Mm-hmm. And um, but there's no doubt that the uh, digi- digital age has made it so easy. Exactly. You know, I mean, years ago, I would of course go to the National Archives and look through a microfilm, you know, and look at records and books and things. Use books and records, things like that, uh, which is diff- difficult. It's very time-consuming and difficult. You know, uh, if you study the history of a person's life and you l- use these old records, it can take ages. And it seems like you never get, you, you write off, you write letters asking for institutions to send you copies, and they write back and say they, don't, they can't find them. Right. So nowadays, to be able to, now it is, it's amazing. You can just look online, you can go through historic newspapers. Which are, which are being digitized right now, like in, is, yeah, yeah, fabulous. It's fabulous, and you can read story, you can read articles, obituaries of people. Um, like for instance, one of my interests is the um, history of the men and women that once worked at Ellis Island. Oh, interesting. You know, who worked for the Immigration Service? Mm-hmm. Uh, thousands of men and women worked here as inspectors, interpreters, matrons, mm-hmm. physicians, nurses. Cleaning women, cleaning men, uh, cooks, and so forth, and they worked on this island, and uh, thousands did between 1892 and 1954 when this place closed. And so, to get a, a, an idea of how Ellis Island was run, I started doing biographical research through records of uh, these people. I, I'd get lists of old employees who had died decades ago, and then I would find out who they, you know their names and what jobs they did. And then I would try to find out, that find them on the censuses, you know, like the 1930 or So you were searching out the family of Ellis Island. That's right. You will. That's right. And was there a story that kind of started to emanate out of that? What were some of the common threads? Well, there, there were common threads that emerged. And one was that... Um, Many of the women that worked here, which was a uh, you know they were most most employees were men, but the women the female force here were mostly people that uh, were either widows or unmarried women, hmm. you know, or who had husbands that had somehow failed to earn the bread, and so they had gone out to work. And um, in those days, women didn't go out to work like today. They didn't have careers like today. It wasn't hmm. considered the thing. A uh, hundred years ago, so it was very unusual. But um, either, but I found that many of the women that had, were charwomen. There was a job title here called charwoman, 
And that was a, it means chore. Mm -hmm. People, women that do chores. They were, they were cleaning women, we would call them. These women were either widows or they were abandoned wives or spinsters or divorcees, which then was considered embarrassing. Right. <laughs> and right. so they actually had to work. And many were immigrants, like Irish women, Swedish women, and German women. And uh, they were low paid, only like $400 a year mm. to scrub the floors at Ellis Island. Many worked here 30 and 40 years. There was no pension. Wow. They never could retire. And um, they, uh, and, but they lived usually pretty long, fairly long lives, I found. Now, I found that many of the men that worked here uh, lived, many of them who were blue collar workers lived, didn't live very long. I found that most died before the age of 60 mm. in the workforce at Ellis Island. And uh, I found the better educated an employee was, like a nurse or a, or a physician or someone like that, they lived much longer. And uh, most of the nurses, who the female nurses, never married. Wow. Never married, because it was a career. And unless they married doctors. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Did you ever get a sense as you researched them what their feelings and attitudes were towards the people they were processing and serving while they were here? Well, yes, in a way. Sometimes you get, because when you research someone like that, you can sometimes come across newspaper articles mm -hmm. about them. And or uh, interviews sometimes done many years ago, and sometimes you get comments, and some of the some of it is you know really positive, uh, but some of it is that they were it, you get the impression it was routine, it was a job they went to, and um, uh, it was a hard job, very hard. Um, there were for the matrons women. There was a class of a white collar woman worker here called matron, mm -hmm. and they help women and children in detention who had problems over right. and who would spend the night here, and they also investigated women who were accused of some kind of offense, immigrant women, and they would go out and actually kind of arrest them and bring them to Ellis Island for That's hearings. A power. <laughs> yeah, so these women had a lot of duties. They were not as well paid as the men inspectors because they were female, of course. That was the reason. Mm -hmm. They uh, worked here for years and years, and they considered their job to be a useful job because they were helping women in trouble, immigrant women in trouble, and children. Because And they opened a nursery here, a nursery or, and a kindergarten, a schoolroom with the help of, of uh, missionaries, missionary women. Mm -hmm. Christian missionary women. Mm. So you had uh, all the different kinds of people. Actually, the missionaries, the missionaries often had did talk a lot about working here. They talked a lot about the schoolrooms and about the Christian aid they gave to immigrants in detention who were being deported sometimes. And they actually went out of their way to help them. There was one woman named Ludmilla Foxley who worked for the YWCA mm -hmm. for 18 years on Ellis Island. Oh. And she was a Czech immigrant herself. She spoke Czech and several other Slavic languages, and German too. And she um, she spent her time helping women and children in detention. And she would she would try her best to solve problems or to explain why a woman's husband is being detained and and why they might have to be deported or excluded, and or or what they needed to do to to get into the country. Mm -hmm. Like, maybe they needed money wired to them. Maybe they needed someone to come and uh, to uh, to give some kind of uh, assurance that they would give the person help of some type in the States. They kind of help them through the ropes, navigating yeah, the, the waters. That's right. Tell everybody, um, give us some perspective on the time frame. So we know that there was a limited uh, longevity of immigration itself, and then I understand it would have stayed open past the time that people were actually being processed through here. So can you give us just a, a brief overview of what the time frame looks like? Yeah. Federal immigration control begins in 1890. The federal government before then left immigration to the states, mm -hmm. and so the federal government decided the states weren't doing a good job. And that, in those days, it really meant New York State, because 80% of immigrants were coming on steamships from Europe to the port of New York, 
New York was the busiest port. It was the cheapest way to enter the USA because so many ships are coming here every week. It meant that you didn't have to pay as much. Like, for instance, if you chose to go to a ship to Boston, it meant、mm-hmm. you might have to pay a little extra money because not as many ships were going to Boston. So, New York was busy. It was the easiest way to enter the country. And most people came through this port. They didn't come here to live in New York,、mm-hmm. they came here to enter the country and pass on through to other destinations in North America. Including Canada. Right. And of course, many of them went out west and to the Midwest.、Those、so are- they start in 1890. How long does Ellis Island stay open as an immigration station? Well, Ellis Island was kept open, by, open until 1954. Okay. 62 years it was in service. And, but the mass immigration ended in the mid 1920s.、Mm-hmm. So for the first 32 years, you have over 12 million immigrants through Ellis Island. And then in the last 30 years or so, you have mostly、uh, cases of immigrants who were in trouble.、Uh, you know, detention cases,、um, immigrants who were. Because what they did is they decided to introduce a new reform back in the early 1920s. And the reform was that immigrants now must have the passports from their governments before they enter the U.S. Before then, you didn't have to have a passport. So that presents a, another big hurdle. Yeah, see, immigrants had no documents before right. 1920. Right. They didn't need any to come here anyway. So, but in 1920, 21, government said, you know, we want immigrants to have their national passport. We want them to have a, a, each country of Europe is given a quota of how many people they can send、mm-hmm. each month、mm-hmm. to the United States. And they cannot exceed the quota. So, it might be France was given maybe a couple of thousand a month. And if, if there was one person above that quota, they were turned away. Right. Another thing they needed was they needed to pay a, a tax to the American consulate in, abroad in their home country to get.、Uh, see, the passport was issued by their own government. You say you were French, you got a French passport. But then you would have to go to the American consulate in Paris, for instance, and get. A visa stamped into the passport. Right. And that usually cost about a dollar. Later on, the price would rise. And then you had to get a quota number for the French quota. And then you were set because you should also have had all the medical examinations to satisfy the American consulate in Paris. And now you could board ship and sail to the U.S. So before then, those three、uh, documents or requirements did not exist. Right. And immigrants had never had that kind of problem. And this created what we call、uh, documented aliens, which had never existed before. Right. And、um, the, it made、uh, immigrants confused, it frustrated them,、uh, it suddenly put barriers in front of them and made them aware they, couldn't, they didn't have freedom of movement as they had previously had. They now had to go through all of these bureaucratic. Uh, you know, steps before they could even get on a ship to come here.、Mm-hmm. So that's why Ellis Island was considered less and less important for immigration because it, this cut down immigration drastically. These new procedures meant a lot of people didn't even try anymore. Well, I imagine as it moved into the 50s, you've also got people coming through airports. Yeah. Not necessarily even through. So even that's shifting where、yeah. that transfer coming into the country is、yeah. happening. Yeah. Well, it, airports,、um, you know, we begin to have immigrants in coming on airline service in the late 30s,、mm-hmm. the first, earliest ones, mostly from Canada, Colonial Airways from Canada, and then throughout the 40s. And we begin to have Air France after World War II, you know, and,、right. and British Overseas Airways as well, and,、um, and German Airways too in the 50s. And Italian. So you, you have,、uh, yeah, the new means of transport. But, but still, when you arrived at the airport, as there are, are, are immigration officers at the seaport landings, the dockings for the ships at the piers, there also were immigration officers now stationed at airports. At airports. So the immigration officers in New York were at Idlewild, which is now,、uh, you know, has been renamed, I think, John F. Kennedy, I think. <laughs> so.、Um, 
uh, and there was another airport called La- LaGuardia Airfield, right. which was the oldest New York airport for international landings. I think that dates from the late 30s. So, and did you say Ellis Island closed in 54? Yeah, Ellis Island was closed by President Eisenhower. So did it close completely? Like all those people that you've been researching, they went home. That was it? Well, or did it kind of yeah. linger? And It closed. The men and women that worked here finally were told that, that, that they would uh, no longer even a report yeah. to duty at Ellis Island any longer. Many were just redirected to other federal offices in New York City or elsewhere across the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, I met a guard, a man who was, who was in his 90s. He came here a couple of years ago. He lives out in the West Coast and um, with his daughter today. But he was hired as an immigration guard okay. in 1946, and he worked here eight years. He was in his 20s then. And um, in 1954, he reminisced to me that he actually was told that uh, they'd had no need uh, for his services and no longer in the immigration service as a guard. So, but they did tell him he could apply for a job in the prison service, which he did. And subsequently, he worked at Folsom Penitentiary and then later right. at Alcatraz. So did, did anything else happen here? Well, after, after well, I'll tell you what, the immigra- Ellis Island was being shared the immigration service was sharing the island at that time with the Coast Guard mm. and with the Public Health Service. And these are three separate agencies, Immigration right. Service, Public Health Service, Coast Guard. Coast Guard had a training station here, and they had Coast Guardsmen stationed here. But that closed uh, also because the whole island was controlled by the Immigration Service. The immigration Service just said, you know, everybody's got to get out of here. Mm-hmm. And um, Immigration Service ordered all of its employees to pack up all the records, all the documents and so forth that had to be retained. Immigrants who were in detention or foreigners in detention were sent to prisons and jails in the New York area instead. Wow. Pearl Buck was a famous American author, and she protested this detention of immigrants with criminals after the closing of Ellis Island. And... um, so after that, you know, there was, of course, uh, even though many people had disliked the memory of Ellis Island, the, the, it was not a popular place, this mm-hmm. place, at that point. See, when it was active with immigration control, people didn't like it as much. Right. And even they were aware of the drama, and they were aware of the human stories, sometimes tragedies, sometimes happy stories. Uh, they knew and they were fascinated with these stories about immigrants on Ellis Island. Nonetheless, they also were aware of the unhappiness right. that was so common. And uh, many immigrants were embarrassed to be to admit that they had come through here. Well, the more time you spent, more likely your yeah. story was a sad one, that you were here for reasons beyond your control. And yeah. uh, Before I let you go, I'd love to have you tell my audience, I know that you've written some books, yeah. and... Um, what they are, the, some titles, and, and how they can learn more about this on their own. Yeah, I've written a few books. One is the Encyclopedia of Ellis Island. Excellent. And, yeah, there's an illustrated edition, which is very beautiful. Mm-hmm. And it's an alphabetical uh, a book where you can actually look up different aspects of the history of this island. And if you're interested, for instance, in, uh, in displaced persons... You know, refugees from World War II, you will find an entry on that kind of topic. It's a, it's a fascinating, you know, yeah. continually refer back to it, and yeah. depending on how you're moving through your own tree That's and right. stories. So you can look at, you can do that. Uh, mm-hmm. Another book I've written is called Children of Ellis Island, and it's about the experience of immigrant children. We had a lot of children that immigrated, right. often with families, but sometimes alone, including stowaways and orphans. Mm-hmm. And I deal with some of that in the Children of Ellis Island. Another book is Ellis Island's Famous Immigrants. Well, I highlight some of the best known of the immigrants of the past who came through this island. Mm-hmm. Among them, Bob Hope, the movie star, and Bela Lugosi, another film star, this too famous for Count Dracula in the movies. And, um, Appropriate for today yeah. as we record on Halloween. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Bela Lugosi, who came through Ellis Island, and he is like a symbol of Halloween. Yeah. Because he never learned to speak very good English, his career was kind of uh, sabotaged by his being forced to constantly play horror roles in right. horror movies. Right. And, um, but he was a, a, he's an icon of Hollywood. Also, another great immigrant is Max Factor, who invented or, or, you know, kind of pioneered much of the modern cosmetics of women today. <laughs> and, um, and all those books are still available, right? Yeah, that's Wonderful. right. They're available, yeah. 
Barry, it's been a joy to talk with you. It's, it's a fascinating story. I love the fact that there's also a family here that was the people who worked at Ellis Island and you That's helping right. kind of bring their story to the forefront as well. Thank you so much it's for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Profile America, Thursday, November 2nd. Even with all of our electronic diversions, many of us listen to radio at some point every day. The wide variety of formats means we can choose our favorite type of music, and radio keeps us up to the minute on news and weather. The presidential election held on this date 97 years ago was the occasion of the first commercial radio broadcast. Station KDKA in Pittsburgh carried the results in which Warren G. Harding defeated the ticket of James Cox and his vice presidential nominee, Franklin Roosevelt, whose famous radio days lay ahead. Just two years later, that first station was joined by 400 others as the popularity of radio swept the nation. Today, there are some 4,700 radio broadcast establishments employing almost 78,000 people. You can find more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. Well, we've come to the end of Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 211. I want to thank contributing editor Sonny Morton and additional content in this episode by your DNA guide, Diane Southard, Military Minutes contributor, Michael Strauss, and of course, the archive lady, Melissa Barker. Thank you to Hannah Fullerton, our audio editor, my daughter, and my travel companion, Hannah Fullerton. To all of you here in the U.S., I wish you a very happy Thanksgiving this 2017. And as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, cultivate the habit of being grateful for every good thing that comes to you and to give thanks continuously. And because all things have contributed to your advancement you should include all things in your gratitude. I'm grateful for you. Thank you for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.